I have the pleasure today of actually having the tables turned on me. So usually I'm the one asking questions, but recently uh, I was in touch with Casey Legler and um, Casey asked some really interesting questions to me about our recent report on the state of fashion. Um, and Casey, um, I'm gonna hand it over to you now, but I would also just like to start by asking you one question, uh, which is to introduce yourself to our community because maybe not everyone in the BOF community is familiar with you and your amazing accomplishments, which I would love for you to share. Yeah. Um, hi, Imran. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's such a, a privilege and a pleasure to be here, truly. Um, and it's true, you know, when you said that you've been doing business of fashion uh, webinars and the talks and kind of talking with all of the authoritative figures in this industry, I was like, you are one of those people. And so I feel really grateful that you agreed to kind of do a little swap. Um, and for those of you who don't know, my name is Casey Legler. Um, I uh, am a former Olympian. I was a swimmer. Um, I'm also a writer. Uh, I wrote my um, first book that was a uh, New York Times bestseller called Godspeed, a memoir about growing up as a teenage girl in the 90s as a professional athlete. And um, I also uh, work in fashion. I was the first woman in 2013 to be signed exclusively to the Ford men's board, which now seems so anarchic, but at the time, <laughs> um, at the time there was no one else doing it. And therein began, um, you know, a, my more intimate affair with fashion. And I have many dear friends who are, um, you know, profoundly influential in the fashion industry. And, um, and this was why I felt compelled to reach out to you, Imran, because, you know, I do believe in beauty um, and I do believe in fashion and, and the celebration of, um, of its artistic abilities and the inspiration that it represents, the imagination, the creativity, and also in many ways, the expression of self that it represents and for me and my community in many ways the queer community has been one of the safest places that we've been able to be ourselves express ourselves but also work in really meaningful and impactful ways so i feel professionally connected but also very personally connected to this industry and i couldn't think of anyone better than you to kind of break down for us, um, you know, for people who know a lot about fashion, but also maybe people who just love beauty, but don't really understand what has happened to the fashion industry, the business of it itself. Um, mm -hmm. And I thought that maybe one of the first things that we could start with is like a general overview of what we mean when we're talking about the business of fashion, like the different markets that exist. And then maybe in that you could tell us what was happening before COVID-19 and the lockdowns? Sure. Um, well, first of all, I share your um, appreciation of the beauty of this industry. It's what first drew me to fashion. I came from a very, very different background, um, which was uh, the management consulting world. And so I spent most of my life or most of my career rather advising large international organizations on business strategy and operations. But I always felt something was missing. And you know, I grew up extremely creative and um, I found myself on a path that somehow led me to this, this industry. Mm -hmm. And I explicitly use the word industry because I think for a lot of people out there who, who know a fashion uh, kind of, from a visual standpoint or from the kind of way the industry projects itself through marketing and campaigns and shows, it's not always apparent just how big a business this really is. Yeah. You know, before COVID, you know, the fashion industry was a $2.5 trillion industry. Yeah. Last year, the fashion industry produced 115 billion garments of clothing. Uh, the fashion industry touches people all over the world 
from the people who make our clothes in places like Bangladesh and India and Vietnam and Cambodia and China, but also in Italy and France and other places, all the way to the people at the retail shop floor who sell the, the clothes to the end, end customer. Mm -hmm. And in between all of those touch points, there are millions of people that work in the business of fashion around the world. And I, one of the first things I always try to get across to people who are, who are kind of exploring or interested in the business of fashion for the first time is just to give them a sense of just the, the enormous scale of this industry. Right. You know, fashion doesn't always get its due attention in the business media or by people generally. And, you know, sometimes even now, you know, if I'm at, at the TED conference or, you know, other places outside my fashion context, and I tell people I work in the fashion industry, people still are kind of dismissive of it as an industry. It's not really taken seriously. And this was really my first set of observations when I started exploring fashion after leaving McKinsey. Uh, and what I learned was actually behind this beautiful imagery behind all of the glamour and excitement and kind of visual artistry of fashion, which of course is what drew me to it in the first place, was this incredibly fascinating industry that was in the midst of what was a, about to be a massive growth spurt. Right. So back in 2000, you know, 2005 or 2006, when I first started exploring fashion, I was looking at the music industry and the film industry and all sorts of other things. And, you know, the music industry was being completely disrupted by peer-to-peer -peer file sharing and like the industry wasn't growing. There was all sorts of questions around how, how, the music industry was going to make money, but fashion by that stage had started the beginning of a growth spurt that has continued unabated for the last you know, 10, 11, 12 years. And so now it's this ginormous industry that reaches people all over the world. And um, you know, it's divided into lots of different layers and segments. And I could spend probably an hour just breaking down talking about all of <laughs> because that's what i that's what i did first when i first started working in fashion was like i tried to make a map of how it all worked right um and i'm not going to bore you with all of that today but i just give you some headline points yeah, which is just the big picture so that if as we kind of dive into solutions questions people will know kind of where we're talking about so i think fashion the fashion business exists in four important steps yep. the first and and probably one of the most important is design and this is like where the creativity happens this is the part that i think people outside fashion are most curious about because it's it's this like magical process like all creative processes and you have these incredibly creative people working in teams to create these impactful collections and shows and experiences and that's like Magical. There's also, by the way, a very technical part of the design process, right? So it's not just the aesthetics, but if you think about it, there's a bit of architecture and engineering and fashion as well, right. right? Which is like, how do you take a garment and they call it grading, right? So once you've designed the garment in a kind of a sample size, how do you take that sample size and technically grade it up? How do you take a pair of shoes? I recently went on a tour with uh, Christian Louboutin, the, the shoe designer, through this exhibition that he staged in Paris. And he was explaining to me the grading process for taking a size, I don't know, a regular, it's like a sample size of shoes and then grading that upwards and downwards. And it's, it's so complex yeah. and so technically sophisticated of taking then also, you know, flat patterns uh, and creating flat patterns out of what is a 3D three-dimensional garment. Yeah, yeah. And so, and I studied architecture yeah. uh, in school. That's the, where I come from. And one of the things that we are often as architect students, eventually one of the projects is oftentimes a shoe because that is absolutely true. And I, I too, the architecture of garments, the architecture of how these things are actually built is one of the things that I was definitely drawn to as well so there's the design so there's then, the design and then the second step is like kind of how you kind of present or or sell or market your clothes to the market now this this 
this step has been disrupted recently because before people used to sell and market their clothes to the industry, which would then figure out a way of selling and marketing clothes straight to the customer. Right. But what's happened recently is we have these like direct to consumer businesses. So right. more and more over the past five or 10 years, with the rise of social media, with the direct channels that brands now have to, to kind of speak with their fans, you can market or your, sell your products directly to the customer. Interesting. But in the era before, you know, the reason a fashion show first existed wasn't to have influencers and celebrities in the front row. The reason people staged a fashion show was to show those clothes to the retailers, right. to show those clothes to the industry so they could place their orders and decide right. what to buy. Which right? is often what you saw. Like, so if you go back and look at some old fashion show photos, you'll often see people with a pen and a paper writing down and they're writing down their orders or trying to remember what it is. And that is, I think some of it has been translated to the phone, but not so much. Now it is just a direct to consumer um, channel that's happening. Interesting. Yeah. So, so after the, after the showing part where you're mm -hmm. like showing to the market and mm -hmm. you know, people, people in our industry said I'm in market. That means I'm like selling my clothes to the market after you've sold the clothes, then you need to manufacture them. Mm. And that's the part I was referring to earlier with all of these incredibly talented garment workers, artisans, people, and like people don't always appreciate just what it takes to manufacture clothing. So much of it is still done by hand. Right. You know, of course, there's machine aided manufacturing now, but you know, it, it is really, even, even with some mass market clothing, it's still something that people's hands touch right. to create, right? And it's a very tactile industry. It's a very right. tactile process for creating those clothes. Mm -hmm. And if you can imagine 115 billion garments of clothes were produced last year, and that's a whole different topic, whether we need all those clothes or not. Right. Yeah. But all of those clothes were touched by human hands and millions and millions of people around the world have that as their job. There's also people in India and in France who have like these like extremely fine embroidery techniques or embellishment techniques or beading techniques. Um, there's, there's just like the creativity and talent of these individuals is, you know, until you've seen it yourself and I've been yeah, privileged enough to see it. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's mind blowing. Right. Uh, and then finally, there's the part where you retail it. And that's right. the part which is the interface with the end customer. That happens in stores. Increasingly now it happens online. And that's the kind of transaction and the relationship with the end customer. And you know, the physical retail experience still remains a big, big, big part of the fashion industry because people still want to try clothes on. Yep. They want that experience of discovering things. Mm. Um, so um, that's kind of how the industry that's has the grown. Landscape. Yeah. So design then the uh marketing of it that has had a few changes initially market to industry and then to the consumer but now there's a marketing that happens direct to consumer and then manufacturing and then retail right yeah. so this was all working in a certain way, in the report that you guys submitted, you point to some of the challenges that the industry was already having, that some of the fashion players, you know, I think like 34% weren't exactly meeting or even able to cover their costs. So it was an industry that had, I think all industries do, but had little pockets of like, okay, this is working, this is not working. There were manufacturing kind of wins and manufacturing questionable practices, kind of like all of this stuff is this industry where we've been, you know, profoundly engaged in all of these since, you know, the 90s, I think, even maybe before. And then COVID happens. Yeah. So what, what exactly happened in each of these? areas that uh have frozen more or less this industry that like you said is 2.5 trillion global 
annual revenue. This is not a small, not a small thing that is employing millions of people. So COVID happens and what happened in each of these spaces? So, I mean, like all industries and fashion is by no means alone in this. It's been, it's been a disruption unlike anything the industry has ever seen. Okay. And that's because along each of the steps that we've discussed, there's been a massive disruption. Hmm. So, you know, on the design side, design has been always a physical process. You know, teams of people work together around what they call the Stockman dummy. And you, if everyone's seen them around, but the Stockman is like the most famous brand, but that's when you have a, a dummy where you drape the garment. Yeah. And the industry has been somewhat resistant to move to like 3D modeling. And like people really like that physical experience of design. Some people sketch and then they turn the sketch into a pattern or a, uh, they do a drape after that. Like there's also, there's no standardized way of designing. Like every creative person has their own way. But regardless of what that process is, it's come to a halt. You know, you cannot be in a, in a small room with 20 people and a team trying to design together anymore. So the entire design process is currently happening virtually. And so designers are trying to figure out like, how do I do 3D design um, long distance via a call or conversation like this? How do I test how the way clothes fit on a model cool. yeah you know, how, how do i how do i know what the fabric feels like how do i know what it feels like on my skin how do i have the discussion with other people on my team so that we can share the experience to talk about it and it's presented a whole new set of design challenges but in this area i actually think the disruption is potentially going to have important long-term benefits because to be honest I, you know, the fashion industry has been a very traditional industry, the one that hasn't really wanted to embrace technology or new ways of doing things. It's one of those industries where like people are comfortable with the way we've always done things. So why should we embrace all of these newfangled technology tools when we have a good old fashioned way of working? It reminds me of what happened in architecture, again, kind of 25 years ago, when we were studying, we, I think I'm the last generation that actually learned how to draft, like that was what we did. Then AutoCAD, Rhino, all of these designs. And when you walk into an architecture firm now, there is not a drafting table in sight, which makes my um, heart kind of flutter and cringe a little bit because there was something so tactile about that experience. And I do agree, fashion has kept, has kept its relationship to the artisan craftsmanship of it to a certain degree. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, my, my dad's an architect, so I grew up with a drafting table. Yeah, so you know, right? Basement, you know, <laughs> and so when he had to transition to AutoCAD, it was a big deal for him. Like he did yeah. it. You know, kudos yeah. to him because he was like, you know, he had to teach himself how to use AutoCAD. And we yeah. have this like PC downstairs in our basement. And, you know, he was like figuring it out. Um, yeah. But yeah, the industry is now forced to make that transition. Yes. You know, that's, what's, that's yeah. what's happening. And so when I'm talking to designers, they're having to figure out things that they completely resisted up until now. And I actually think, of course, at some point, People will be able to be together again. Design teams will be able to work together again. But I think some of the processes and innovations that have been forced upon the design process as a result of the- expand. Yeah, and I think it will, the, some of these behaviors and ideas will um, continue. Like people used to feel like they had to fly all the way to the other side of the world in order to have a conversation with the factory to see how the sample was being made. But all of that is being disintermediated now. Like you, right, you don't yeah. need to do that. So there's some efficiencies there that I think will happen. Okay. On the second step, which is about how you go to market, mm. you know, this has been also really challenging because you know, the coronavirus uh, pandemic as it's rolled across the world, um, starting in China earlier this year and now 
into Europe, North America, and beyond, it was happening just as fashion weeks were happening. So like fashion week, fashion week starts in January and fashion week, um, you know, in contrary or in contrast to the name fashion week it fashion week actually lasts There's many weeks months, months. it it's lasts like, from the first starts. week of january until <laughs> early march totally it's, it's so this beat. Whole, yeah, yeah this whole pandemic was kind of un, unfurling mm-hmm. just as fashion week was rolling across, uh, rolling out across the world and the first country that was impacted was china right and when we were all at fashion week in february None of the Chinese buyers, editors, influencers, like the people who do the business of fashion in China, they weren't able to come to Fashion Week. They were quarantined. There were no flights. They weren't allowed to travel. And so in that instance, the going to market, and by the way, China is the biggest fashion market in the world now. Yeah. Yeah. And so not having those Chinese buyers and editors there was really quite a big deal. And so instantly, again, the industry had to innovate and they started doing virtual showrooms. They started doing sales appointments by, by FaceTime or Zoom or WeChat. And so the business of going to market had to happen virtually, even though the physical shows were still happening. Some of the attendees weren't able to be there. And was it as, so we talked about the design perspective, having some th- like that was continuing ongoing innovation ultimately some efficiencies were going to be beneficial going to market was that as successful it had to be okay you know and i think the challenge was is that the pandemic really started to take hold in europe right around the end of milan fashion week yep. and then yep. into paris fashion into week paris. yep and then it all started becoming very real for people but that innovation had started and i think actually we got a real sign of what like fashion week of the future might be like when shanghai fashion week happened at the end of march yeah and that was an entirely digital fashion week because there's no possibility to have physical attendees and if you look ahead to june when the men's shows are supposed to happen and july when the haute couture shows are supposed to happen and to September, when the women's shows are supposed to happen again, people are now looking to how things worked in Shanghai to understand what Fashion Week for the rest of the year is going to look like. Because there will be no shows in the first half of the year, and it looks very unlikely that we'll, there will be any shows for the remainder of the year. So we're going to have to come up with a virtual going to market. You know, virtual shows, virtual showrooms, virtual transactions virtual ways of doing business. And again, I think actually, you know, some of the buyers, because of the way the fashion week, fashion calendar is laid out, they end up traveling for 10 months a year. Right. And, you know, this has become increasing. Travel. Yeah, it's become increasingly unsustainable, just even just on a personal level for people to be out of the office and away from home for 10 months, Mm -hmm. constantly traveling. It's just, those are the, the most stressed out under pressure people mm. in our industry is the buyers because they were just constantly traveling. And I think some of them are now saying like, wow, like I don't, I don't have to travel. I can just do it virtually. I can do it you know, via Zoom or FaceTime or some other tool to help me do right. my job. So I think, again, that's an area where I think there's going to be a real you know, fundamental shift in the way the industry works. That's so trippy because it's also, you know, now we're getting closer and closer to the actual garment, right? And this idea that there is a a virtual shows and virtual going to market, virtual, uh, virtual studio visits, which we all love, you know, going into all virtual, yet the outcome is this very tactile uh it's like the w- the mitigation of that just from a, a headspace point of view seems very sci-fi future almost it totally, like it totally is dilemma, right you have these ideas that are floating around in the ether and yet the outcome is yeah. going to be and remain this very you know tactile uh piece yeah okay so going to market yeah, and I, I should say that, you know, I think both the design process and the going to market process, elements that have existed previously will return. 
Okay. But I think what it's forced the industry to do is operate in a completely unprecedented scenario. And eventually, you know, people will still want to touch garments. People will still want to drape them. People will still want to work together. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's not going to go away. I just think it'll be augmented by digital tools and processes that people were resistant to embrace before. I like the idea too of, you know, cause I, you know, it's true. Our industry travels a lot. And so the idea of mitigating some of that travel is not necessarily essential travel or needed travel sounds interesting not only from a personally sustainable level but then also as we you know talk about what a future might look like just from a generally sustainable perspective um okay so we've done design we've done going to market now i think we get into manufacturing and then to retail is yeah. this this is this these are the two places where the damage that's been done is just it's almost unfathomable. And so for an industry that relies on millions of people around the world to make clothes from, you know, the garment workers in Bangladesh making t-shirts to artisanal, you know, craftspeople in India and Italy and France and other places, literally making products by hand, luxury products, um, it's been devastating. You know, the entire supply chain has been disrupted. Factories have been closed. Um, and, you know, many of the people who make clothing, you know, in especially these developing markets, they live hand to mouth. You know, they live, you know, paycheck to paycheck. Mm -hmm. And so when, you know, the prime minister of India gave four hours notice for an entire country of 1.3 billion people to be locked down, there was absolute panic and this is a country uh, and, and and india is not alone bangladesh is the same where the idea of like physical distancing or social distancing is just not possible right. because these are like tightly packed um very densely populated countries and by the way all of the, these people make things with their hands in factories that are also quite tightly packed and so the instant impact there was like millions of people didn't have jobs. And, you know, we'll get to retail in a minute be, uh, because there's also been a lot of loss in, in, in the retail world. But these workers are not protected by, um, you know, furlough schemes supported by the American government or the UK government or the French government that kind of can help to support businesses to keep these people employed because what happened is a lot of the big players they just started canceling their orders right. and that you know i had some discussions with some of the factory owners in in india and there was a real negotiation with these big companies like the gap and primark and you know marks and spencer and uniqlo to say listen like if you cancel all your orders like what's going to happen to the livelihood of these people who make who've been making your clothes for you know decades and if you want to go back to business, like we need to keep these people secure because the government schemes in these developing countries don't allow for that to happen. So there's been a massive supply chain disruption. And the other, other disruption on the, on the supply side has been that there's, there's tons of stock. Right. It's just sitting around and it's stock in various degrees of completion. So you have, you know, raw materials and fabrics that were meant to be manufactured that are just sitting there not being manufactured. And then all across the kind of supply chain of creating a garment, you have finished items of clothing sitting in warehouse waiting to be put on a ship to somewhere in the world. You have, you know, finished garments sitting in retailers' factories. And then you have finished garments sitting on the shop floor. So you have this like, mm, we're, we're going to have, you know, one statistic I heard is that we have three times the excess stock that we've ever had in the fashion industry. So when things wow. begin to open up, there's going to be a real reckoning when it comes to how do we clear out this merchandise? Because, you know, one thing of course is to put it on sale and, you know, there's pros and cons with doing that. And, and you know, we can talk about that in a minute, but then also traditionally, one of the dirty secrets of the fashion yep. industry is people would just destroy garments. They would throw them away. 
and increasingly that's seen as an unacceptable practice in our yeah. industry and so yeah and know, that's why i appreciated that in the memo and uh in that it didn't shy away from you know kind of like the challenges of what all of this meant and what we were doing already it reminds me of the restaurant industry right so i work and manage and came up through restaurants and um we had to, an entire industry had to close down and very similarly there was this reckoning that had to happen with in the united states in new york city these big massive michelin star restaurant players having to reckon with the fact that they were uh, working within a system that, you know, the guy in the dish pit was actually working paycheck to paycheck. This is in the United States, in New York City, paycheck to paycheck, maybe had to have three jobs and then suddenly didn't have any. And these, you know, kind of luxurious, um, you know, beautiful epitomes of what it means to run a restaurant and cuisine in New York City um, were suddenly like, oh my gosh, we, we don't know what to do with the guy who has been making this possible from the beginning. So it's true, right? In Bangladesh and India, there isn't kind of like a furlough scheme, but in many of the industries, even in the United States, New York City, there is no furlough scheme for, you know, um, you know, not dissimilar to the fashion industry, the hospitality industry is having to reckon with how it has been functioning and it's been working because nothing's really interrupted these paychecks to people who really need them. And then suddenly it's like, how do you, you know, how do you navigate that stuff? And then also stock restaurants very similarly not unusually have a tremendous amount of food that at the end of the day they actually can't give away because of all of the different rules and things so they end up throwing it away and here in fashion and you pointed out so beautifully in the report it's like there are some standard practices some worse and some better than others that we've done over the lifespan of the fashion industry but what now because it's true we're gonna come out of this and like three times more stock i i wonder what that i don't know what that means for us but i'm curious around what questions we can ask ourselves around like oh well what what do we do i mean we're an industry of like massively hyper creative people surely there's going to be something that comes from that and generally speaking also generous you know of course with meeting the bottom line but but i think that those are traits that are a part of this industry that um hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, there are other solutions that the industry hasn't fully embraced yet around like, like upcy what? upcycling, use of dead stock. Like there are other ways of taking some of this excess stock and putting it back mm -hmm. into the system and to think about this, you know, this, you know, term of the circular economy where you think about other ways of taking end of life um, materials or things that haven't sold and making sure they don't just get thrown away, that there's a way of kind of injecting them back mm. into the process. So we'll have to see what happens, but the disruption to the manufacturing process has just been, you know, unimaginable. I mean, I've, I, it's just been, you know, really, really devastating. And there's a, there's a kind of, you know, personal human story here as well that, you know, we've been really trying to focus on in our coverage of this industry, because it's really important that people understand that this is what's happening. Right. So I was gonna, you know, maybe now is a good time to shift to what, so, I mean, we'll end with kind of the retailers, they're closed. Like yeah. that is what has happened. Um, yeah. But maybe now is a good time in the conversation to shift to one of the questions that I thought, you know, I don't know much about it, but that maybe you could elaborate on, because I know some of my friends who are at the head of other companies have started implementing um, an environmental PL right as as a part of best practice and it's still pretty unusual or uncommon but i wonder if you could maybe break down a little bit what that is and is that maybe one of the areas that might offer some solutions to some of these things mm -hmm. so first just quickly touching on the retail because it's the last step yep. all the stores are closed and there's millions of workers who also there have no jobs and so because of the scale of the fashion industry and how hard it's been hit, you know, when people talk about, 
you know, I think the latest number was 26 million people in the U.S. That's right. Are, are out of work. Millions of those people are people who work in fashion retail. You yeah. know, and so um, the 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 demand side disruption has been really um, kind of uh, drastic and and devastating, just like the supply side was. And then the the question I think people are grappling with now is just you know, how is that demand going to come back? You know, when things slowly start to open up, it's not like there's going to be a big stampede to retail stores because the consumer through this right. whole process, the customer mindset has completely shifted. And so people, maybe they don't want to try on garments in a store. Maybe they don't even want to buy any new clothes. They're focused on other things. You know, maybe they've lost their job. Maybe they think fashion is super frivolous and like, you know, it's not important right now. There's all sorts of things that are going into consumers' minds. On the second um, part of your question, which was really about, well, how do we think about the industry going, going forward? The, yes, there is this thing called the EPNL, which is the Environmental Profit and Loss Statement. And it, it was pioneered by this guy named Jochen Zeitz, who um, was the CEO of Puma. And at the time, Puma was owned by Caring, the luxury group that owns Stella McCartney and right. Balenciaga and Gucci. And Caring is still using this EP&L. And I think it's one of the most um, important ways of thinking about the impact that the fashion industry has. And without going in all, into all the technical details right. about it, um, you know, it basically enables companies to measure their impact on people and the planet just as much as it does the impact that the business has in terms of generating profitable returns. Mm -hmm. And so um, by setting goals and metrics around the environmental profit and loss, um, the company is being held, those brands at Caring and elsewhere are being held to those goals in the same way they're being held to profitability targets. And it's just, as soon as you I, I don't know who the person was that first said, said this, but if you don't measure something, it doesn't matter. Right. So simply being able to measure and point to it become, makes it more important the way businesses are run. And there's, you know, at every step along that entire value chain that we discussed at the beginning of the conversation, there are opportunities for efficiencies and reducing the carbon footprint of this industry. Mm. And that's really what the EPNL is about. Hmm. And what are some of the other, um, what are some of the other kind of openings that are happening? Like when you, given all of the information that you have access to, when you think of a vision of the future of fashion, and I think I always say this in my conversations that maybe it's because I'm French that I don't mind the end point actually just being another question. <laughs> Cause I think that those questions like is also kind of slowly lead us to maybe an answer. I'd, I don't know, but I, I wonder if you could kind of from your vantage point, that is one that is actually quite uh, cohesive. If you could think of, uh, you know, like three questions that the folks in our industries are um, should be asking themselves, or what are the things that they could potentially be focusing on to, you know, open back up and continue employment? Is there a different way of employing? Is there a different way of manufacturing? Is there, you know, what are those things for you? Yeah, well, We've been talking a lot, and this was in the introduction to the report, the, 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 like the phraseology we've been using is about how we can rewire the fashion industry. Mm. Right? It's a magical industry. It has such enormous impact, um, both you know, from a kind of business standpoint, but just from a cultural standpoint. Hopefully. Both of those things, yeah. it's one of the few that holds yeah. both of them. It's, it's so important. It's you know? so important. Goosebumps. It's yeah, fashion is such a reflection of culture. We can't lose that. That being said, it's been a long time now that I think people working in fashion have been saying to themselves, this system that we've created, is just not fit for purpose anymore. Right. You know, we're creating 
too many garments. There's too many collections. There's too many shows. There's too much waste. There's too many brands. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sadly, part of what's going to happen through this process is there is going to, you know, inevitably be a shakeout, which is one of the things we talk about in the report. Yeah. You know, uh, there are players in the industry that have been muddling along for years, barely eking out a profit or actually destroying value. Right. The longer that the lockdowns last, the more companies are going to fall into financial distress. And I think, well, there's going to be a lot of, um, you know, damage and destruction. I think it will open a way for a new, a new industry. And, you know, some people talk about, I think it's Schumpeter, Joseph Schumpeter, who talks about creative destruction. Sometimes mm -hmm. you need to destroy what's already there to create an opportunity for something new. And I think if there's anything that comes out of this experience for our industry, it's that, that opportunity for the industry to rewire and reinvent itself. And I think about that in three really important ways. The first is, it's just from a sheer business standpoint, how can we be more efficient? You know, there's, you know, budgets are gonna be tighter now. People are gonna spend yep. less money on fashion. People are just going to spend less money generally. Yeah. That means we don't no long we no longer have the opportunity to take advantage of the largesse of these massive companies that have unlimited budgets to do whatever they want. Mm. It's going to be imperative that the industry finds a way of being more efficient, and that's going to directly lead to you know goals around profitability. And so efficiency is the first theme that I think about. That but, Sounds exciting though. What a challenge, yeah. right? Because yeah. Because we are, I mean, there was a lot of flamboyant excess happening. And the idea of just like how to be more precise and concise in that seems really thrilling and an exciting and devastating problem to have to solve. And okay. we must solve it. And now is the time when a lot of people in the industry are are thinking about that. So that entire system of like endless fashion weeks and you know, endless budgets and endless collections and 115 billion garments of clothing. Like, I think all of that is going to change. And mm. I think that's a good thing. Mm. The second thing is in the background, while the coronavirus crisis has been unfolding, we still have this other massive global issue around the climate. Right. And, um, you know, when you look at the numbers, and you look at the and you listen to the experts and the scientists and the climate scientists about their views on where we're heading to as a as an entire planet you know it's really frightening right. and um, this is an industry that has a lot of impact negative impact on the planet and so i think you know there has been a conversation around sustainability in the fashion industry that's been going on for some time now. I would say it's still been happening on the periphery. Yep. But all of a sudden, the mainstream, people who never really talked about this stuff before are starting to think about it. Right. And if that's one thing that happens as a result of this crisis, then great. Because the more people we have really trying to solve these problems and think about it, um, the more likely we're going to be able to address the, the huge environmental footprint that the fashion industry has. But I, you know, again, kind of, I get excited about that because it's like, you know, one of the things that has always occurred to me is fashion as an industry has always felt very timid about its power and its space and actually kind of its position as a you know, global industry that holds space. And so the idea of it having um, the awareness to land back into its power in a way and then launch forward, not only with all this massive creativity that it's known for, but using that, you know, kind of global impact to inform something so vital like climate like it's irrefutable you can't look anywhere without kind of being up against having to make a choice or a decision about it that seems 
um, that's so promising that not only have you like myself, we've been hearing it on the periphery, but that it start, that it has in the past six weeks even been something that people who normally wouldn't talk about it are talking about it. That's fantastic because I think that as an industry, we can make an impact. We're massive. We're massive. Absolutely. And, and we should. And, and, you, and the imperative is upon us to take that action because once we're through this pandemic, we still have this looming climate crisis to deal with. And, you know, our industry has a big role to play yeah. in both giving visibility to that crisis and addressing and solving the problems related to Within. it. Yeah. Okay. And then the final, the final thing that I really hope our industry will think about is going back to the people, you know, and it's been really harrowing for me just watching and hearing the stories from um, people around the world that we've been in touch with that, you know, the stories that our amazing editorial team has been telling about workers' rights in warehouses, workers' rights in retail settings and workers' rights in factories. And as an industry that employs millions of people around the world, you know, I think our industry can do a better job at how those as the frontline workers, the people at the coal face of the industry, how they're being treated and paid and rewarded for the work that they do. And, you know, um, I'm hopeful that, you know, this will be an opportunity that the coronavirus crisis has put a magnifying glass on those people. And we're, you know, we're telling those stories almost every day at BOF, just because it's so important that we, we not lose sight of the fact that this is an industry driven and made possible by the people who make our clothes, by the people who pack those packages in the warehouses, by the people who serve us in the stores. Because without those people, the industry can't exist. Right. All of that amazing creativity we talked about at the beginning, it has no way of, of justifying itself without the people who can actually make the business of fashion happen. So right. that's my third bucket. I feel like we just got gold mined, you know, like I just feel like you just dropped such um, treasures and I'm so grateful for it. Uh, I really truly am because it's while dark what's happening right now. I think that, as you said, if there is an increased awareness and acceptance about what is happening, our industry, I really do believe has the creativity, the grit, and the ability to really come out of this in a, in a completely we rewired way, as you said. Yeah, um, I hope so. I feel like this is a great place to stop, Imran. Do you or do you? Yeah, no, I mean, thank you for your questions. I think I learned a lot just thinking about them. And oh, I learned so much. And I know, I know that people will watch this um, uh, in and outside of fashion and will have kind of hopefully have a general framework and outline about how from photographers to designers to manufacturers the sieves that they can start putting their ideas through and you gave us three really beautiful ones okay well it was it was so nice to meet you virtually i'm getting so used, nice you i'm too. getting used to this now usually i meet people in person but um i hope our paths We'll cross in person at some point soon and, and we can get to know each other better. I really enjoyed the conversation. Same, deeply, deeply. All right. And see. thanks to all of you for joining um, you. our latest episode of BOF Live. Um, you have been joining us in large numbers from all around the world and we're really grateful for your uh, engagement and continuing to follow BOF. So thanks everybody. See ya. Bye.